Hi, my name is Isabella Johnston, and today's tip of the week for the Intern Whisper is about sectors that are adopting VR remote collaboration. And just as a reminder, you can always listen to us on our Employers for Change YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast streaming channel. So industries, which ones are they? Healthcare. Um, companies are beginning to use VR and AR to, well, more VR, to actually train for critical surgeries, streamline patient data, and check vitals with face, hand, and eye tracking tools. Companies are partnering to bring this technology um, that are in the Halo Anatomy and Halo Anatomy Neuro Suites to make learning more realistic. Another industry is the real estate industry, and firms are developing off-the-plan virtual showrooms for global customers to be able to see what it is like for a, some type of development where people would live and shop. This is streamlined the purchase process for real estate agents and builders, and companies continue to use them for their properties as an efficient, persistent means to tour real estate, like digital twins. Um, the manufacturing industry. Firms are using VR to boost quality control of manufacturing by improving safety, monitoring data in real time, and securing smart facilities with digital twins. The architecture industry is using uh, this in engineering and also in construction, and it's used to design accurate digital twins of future and current designs, and even creating time-lapsed versions with sensor data. And the last one that we're seeing this in is in the marketing. Marketing products has never been easier and more engaging than with VR solutions. Nike, Adidas, Timberland, they're all using these types of technologies to team up with metaverse firms such as Epic Games and Unity to create communities of product enthusiasts. So keep your eye out, AR and VR is coming folks. Thank you, Isabella. Hi, welcome to the Intern Whisper. My name is Isabella, and today's guest, super excited about having him, is Nathan Pettyjohn. He is with Immerse Global Summit and VRAR Association. And where I met him is super cool. I was at the my, uh, Miami Immerse event, at, or global immerse or immerse you're going to correct me i know you're going to fix it so he's a futurist a visionary a speaker a commercial development guy he's all in the real estate side too so i think he's going to be somebody that will be a great guest and i hope all of my listeners are going to be super excited to hear what he's going to share today so welcome thanks isabella i'm really happy to be here too Super good. So one of the things that I always ask my guests to do is tell five words that describe them and why those five words. So don't worry, I wrote them down too. I can help you. All right. Yes. So I think one is it's not easy, but I try all the time to be very self-motivated. Mm. Um, I try to be a person of integrity. So doing the right thing when no one's looking. Uh, I'm always trying to be an innovator. Um, and doing things better, mm -hmm. which also means never thinking that you know it all or that you've achieved all you can achieve. Um, I like to be a visionary just because it's fun and you get to think about really cool things that could impact a lot of people. And and then finally, number five would be uh, inspiring. And you know, I've kind of made it a life mission to to help over a hundred million people achieve greater levels of success. And so. That means giving them tools, resources, opportunities to to be inspired and kind of think creatively and and then find their own path to achieving more. Wow. A hundred million people is a lot of people. I don't know. That's a big uh what is it, clicker <laughs> to cl yeah. you know, keep track of. I'm sure you're tracking that all through your, you know, events that you're hosting and all of the VR AR chapters that are all over the United States and I'm going to guess global. You're going to tell us that too. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it, it's, it's not easy to track very specifically. Um, but it's, it's trying to, to put a big number out there, um, as a vision because, you know, I found that I, I kind of attack 
problems differently, you know, how, how you set the goals differently. So if I went out and said, I wanted to help, um, uh, 5,000 people, I would, I would take steps to do that very differently. And so when you think bigger, right, it's, it's helping more people. Um, and then you, you, you go about it very differently. And so, yeah, it's, um, the, the hundred million people is, is really, I, I got motivated when I, I, after I started the VR air association, um, this was back in 2015 and here we are in 2023 where we're now the largest global trade association for virtual reality and augmented reality. We have, um, over, I think 65,000 people on an email newsletter. We have about 800 companies that are paying companies annually that are members of our organization, 60 chapters around the world. And, and then when we started doing the math and looking at the last couple of years, who, who's attended all of our hundreds of uh, virtual and in-person events. And it's, it's over 70,000 people. And, and it's like, Hey, we've impacted a lot and, but we've got to do way more. We're just getting started. And, and I realized that like we had built this really cool network of people and enabled people to, to help others. And that if we, if we take that and say, well, how would I amplify that times a hundred you know, it would be going way about above and beyond the virtual reality and augmented reality market. And it would be kind of taking that model and applying it almost as an association to many different industries. So that's part of the goal is to to build out this collection of associations um, that impact a lot of people and doing it across different industry verticals is, is one way to achieve it. Mm -hmm. And, and then also what we realized is every company out there needs help typically marketing and selling. And so we want to try to help with uh, tools and training programs to help people be better at creating market awareness, be better at, um, you know, actually selling a product or a service or, or whatever it is. Cause we're all out there selling something every day, even yeah, if we're not we in sales. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, when I talk with students that are uh, looking for internships and they go, well, I really don't want to be in sales. And I go, well, let me reframe it for you. Just think about it. Um, how did you get your first boyfriend or girlfriend? You, you, yeah. know, you had to sell them something about yourself that you're, you know, you're really appealing, right? And I said, how did you get that job? Because you're still selling. So really selling is, uh, we need to reframe the definition of, and it's really about a relationship. So I'm always looking for people that are relational because I'm extremely relational. And I like to do business with my customers that way. I'm going, this isn't like a one-off. This is like, I, I want a relationship here where you can tell me if something's not working right, we can fix it, right? So that's what sounds like you are too. You're very relational and intentional in how you're rolling out this scalable association. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, that's a good way to put it. Um, and you struck on something that's interesting, right? It's, it's very intentional, but I think uh, what I've learned is you you start with one intention and you just have to take action. And and sometimes too many people spend way too much time planning, in my opinion, or trying to get like the perfect business plan or what's my perfect growth plan. And it's like, well, if you just did something today, it's better than, than nothing usually. Yeah. And, and no matter how well you plan, you're going to find that it's never 100% accurate. But once you start an action, Right. You, you say, you know, for example, in the VR Air Association, we started off launching chapters by cities and created like these little networking groups that could come together, 30, 50, 100 people. And then, you know, we started just listening to our member base and they would say, well, hey, I'm interested in healthcare, And there's very few companies in this geography that are really doing healthcare care in virtual reality. And we said, okay, well, how do we achieve that? Well, let's start a committee, right? It's not, it's not rocket science, but mm -hmm. <laughs> people have done it before. But we said, let's start a committee. And then we started kind of a program for all these committees. And now we have about 25 industry committees that meet every two weeks and they're highly active. And, you know, and, and uh, we, we just continue to listen. So when somebody says, hey, I want to start a committee on this topic, we say, all right, let's do it. Let's enable it. So. You know, just, just one example of how you kind of start and think you're going to build a business one way, and then it starts taking other paths as long as you listen to your customer and what they need. 
Yeah. Customer discovery is everything. And it's the same for employees, right? Because they're still a customer inside of the company. So that feedback loop is critical to, to be innovative. And, yeah. you know, I know that was one of your words too. So I'm digging it. <laughs> um, you didn't, let's go back a little bit though. Where did you go to school? How did you get started? Where, and how did you grow to where you are now? Because I know I asked you about the hundred million <laughs> people you're going to serve. I'm going, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a step back. Well, when I think about education, uh, it, it actually starts like really young for me and it goes a lot farther beyond, you know, school. I think, um, I was, uh, I was inspired by a lot of things, but you know, I, I will say when I was like five year old, five years old, I had this really just like profound life changing realization and, and I still remember it to this day. And part of it comes from my my parents and my dad, especially, who's been very entrepreneurial and very creative. And, um, you know, as a kid, I think most all of us draw pictures mm -hmm. and we think they're cool. Hey, look, mom and dad, look, look what I drew. And I think it was my parents. Somebody said, um, oh, wow, that's so good. I, I'd give you a dollar for that. And I was like, cha-ching. Yeah. <laughs> what? somebody would pay me for my art. Like, Oh yeah, I love it. You know? And, and I had this uh, funny idea that I would just, I would draw a bunch of pictures and I would go to my neighbors and I would write on the little artwork, like, you know, you pay $1 mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and they paid it. And they did. Oh my God. <laughs> Five years and I remember, I, I didn't think they felt sorry for me or they thought I was cute or something, you know, like, yeah. Oh, look, um, but I remember coming back and my parents were like a little embarrassed. They're like, what? You're going around the neighborhood asking people to pay you for your art. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like that, like inspiration. I'll never forget it. It was really impactful. Yeah. And I was like, wow, people will pay me for just doing something. And I just have to go ask him. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like, as you grow up, you lose some of that innocence. And so I, I try to reflect on that every now and then when it's just like, remember that feeling. When mm -hmm. I was five years old and I didn't care if anyone said no, I just thought it was cool if they said yes. So I think that was a good educational experience, but, um, I did, you know, I went to university in a small town, Springfield, Missouri in Southwest Missouri. It's a college town, a small liberal arts college. Uh, I played soccer. We were the smallest division one NCAA division one soccer school in the country. Um, but I realized I wasn't going to be, in the MLS. Um, so I decided to start getting more active in student led groups. Um, I ended up leading, uh, a competitive advertising, uh, group that was at a national level. And so we got to work on big brands like Toyota, the New York times, pizza hut, yeah. and, and like they would give us real problems. And then we would build a plan for half of a year, build a whole 40 page book on it and then go present it. And it, it just taught me a lot about um, working with people, challenges, you know, like in college, you start realizing like, hey, the 80-20 rule, 20% 20 of the people are going to do 80% of the work. And how do I motivate them? How do I get them inspired to do mm -hmm. more? Um, and it was just exhilarating. You get to deal with big brands. Um, and then I used that and I went, um, I went to New York City and worked at a big ad agency and I had kind of a portfolio, like coming out of college and they said, you know, 99% of people who aren't creatives don't have a portfolio. And and I had one. Mm. Um, but I would say then, you know, kind of fast forwarding through education, uh, throughout my life. Um, you know, you, you just get a lot of real world experience, but then probably, uh, three or four years ago, I started really taking it serious and saying, Hey, I'm going to take a portion of the income that I have every year and invest it in training myself, like really professional training programs. And, and then I'm going to do that with employees as well. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really valuable. And I think a lot of people take it for granted who are uh, career professionals and they go into work every day and they're kind of practicing on game day. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, I've heard, you probably heard these analogies too, right? Where it's like, Hey, uh, an NBA player, you would never expect them to just play in the games. That would be ridiculous. Yeah, they would never be in the NBA. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. practice every day. Yeah. And they practice 
even the basics. And, and then you look at like most of us in a normal professional career, it's like, I bet nine out of 10 people, you're like, when was the last time you practiced the basics of what you do, the basics of selling, the basics of marketing? Mm -hmm. And like, how would you expect to be a pro if you didn't do that? So. You know, I could not agree with you more because in my platform, I designed it around peer and reverse mentoring. And that is that reinforcement of the cognitive skills, but also the tasks that they do. Um, and so, yes, that is really where you see that deeper level of learning take place inside of a company. And I'm going to build on top of it, not just on the athlete. I do not want the doctor to come and perform surgery on me that he's going, oh, no, I just do this, you know, like when I'm scheduled to do it. No, thank you. That's why you right. do a residency, right? And you're supposed to be like practicing on dead people and everything else that you can find in VR, you know, and those types of opportunities. Right. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. I don't want the person fixing my brakes that goes, no, I only did it in class like 10 times. So I, I know what I'm yeah. No. And that was 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so crazy. Right. So crazy. So, yeah. So that's interesting. Where did you go to school, though? I don't think you mentioned that. Oh, uh, yeah. I went to Drury University. I've heard of that school. Yeah. It's, it's really it's really a good quality school. Yeah. yeah. Small, but very good quality. Liberal, liberal studies, I believe, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I actually majored in advertising communications, which is pretty unique. Very nice. Very yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, I graduated from Rollins College here, liberal studies also, but, you know, English major. So, but I'm, I'm surprised that they had that program there because normally they don't have something that's advertising or they'll call it communications now. Yeah. Doing. We were pretty fortunate. We had, um, there was uh, the person who headed that school came he had, you know, global experience at some of the biggest advertising agencies in the world. And, um, you know, long story short, he ended up there and, and he was actually the one who encouraged me to, to go to New York city and work at one of the big firms. And, uh, I wasn't going to do it. I was going to stay at a local firm, which was really high quality people. Um, but I ended up, you know, renting a U-Haul and driving up to New York city and living in a studio basement apartment out of the gates. Mm-hmm. With no windows. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but I was working in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> so do you wish you stayed with the other company? Um, the good people? <laughs> no, I think it was a good experience to get out there and try something new. Mm -hmm. But I also realized that, you know, there, there are really intelligent, amazing people everywhere. Yes. Um, you know, I was work. I was working at a, a boutique ad agency. Actually, really high quality work they did for like the food service industry. Mm -hmm. Some of the biggest brands in the world. But you know, they would like work for Starbucks, but then they would they would do stuff that wasn't like the big ads on TV. It would be like a lot of the in store promotional stuff for Starbucks. So, but I did. I I kind of reflected after I went to New York, and I was like, there are a lot of people in the big New York city, you know, kind of cog, if you will, that are kind of just going through the motions, kind of just kind of t taking each step as it goes. Mm -hmm. But, and, and it just kind of made me realize like, Hey, there's, there's amazing people everywhere. And sometimes you don't realize how good you might have it. And some of the brilliant people you're already working with. Yeah. Cause you're just thinking like, Oh, it's the next, the next thing is better. It's gotta be. You know, the whole grass is greener on the other side. Yeah, that's really a, a sad life, right? Yeah. 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 So doing some research when you were mentioning, um, you know, a couple of things, I was looking up to see what VR and AR um, industries are, you know, really embracing um, this type of technology. And it says healthcare, um, real estate, which really surprises me because real estate doesn't spend, that industry doesn't spend much on, on anything except for, you know, <laughs> just holding on to it for a little bit until your next check comes in, uh, commercial side. So I applaud you for being in that industry also. Um, architecture, manufacturing, and marketing. And marketing, they're looking at how it can help with the brands that you were mentioning, like Nike and Adidas and how they're teaming up with, um, other companies like Epic Games to just really 
get people to, you know, rally around those products. So I think sports and inter entertainment are going to be other industries that are going to be obviously joining that AR VR space too. What do you think? You think it's going to be other industries that I will tell you, I'm in the yeah. training and learning space. So um, for the past, I don't know, there's like something, oh, it's next door. And I'm going to hope that it's not this really loud noise because they, <laughs> it's a sound studio and they're turning their volumes up. Um, the training and learning space is really beginning to embrace VR and AR across all different types of industries, like, you know, financial services, and it can be in government, and it can be in marketing firms, you know, they always have an HR person. And I saw at this, uh, they did have something called Demo Fest, it was uh, Learning Solutions. And they had half of the companies there were doing AR, VR type of technologies, whether it was learning how to um, do some type of a scavenger hunt to find things, or to reinforce a skill like surgery. So I'm in that space and, and I follow this a lot. You know, what are the trends in uh, education as well as in the workplace and how that is playing in there? Um, what are your thoughts? Do you see any other industries that are going to be embracing AR, VR other than, I mean, healthcare, I get it. You know, they practice, but the little hands and they do surgery. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I I firmly believe every industry in the world will be impacted by this technology. Um, I think that AR, VR, MR, XR, whatever you want to call it, it's all kind of immersive technologies. Mm -hmm. And then it starts blending with all kinds of things like artificial intelligence and robotics and and cloud computing, all that. So it, it blends together, but I feel like it's it's really it's a tool. Um you know, and the, and it's a tool that can be applied to almost anything. And so you mentioned several of the the industries, like one, you know, marketing and advertising. If you look at like the the number one most used augmented reality company, uh, I think it I think it's arguable that it's Snapchat or Snap, mm. and um, people are using it all the time. Like, and and you could kind of. It can be debated if it's AR or if it's like just a filter, but it's, I think it's an augmented reality. It's augmenting your reality, um, like these face filters and things, right? And you can also place, yeah. And it's unbelievable the amount of use it gets and brands are using it to market. You know, I mean, it, this is even several years ago, Gatorade did some promotion where you could, you know, splash Gatorade on you and it like literally looks like it's bouncing off your face and your body because it's mm -hmm. kind of mapping that. And I mean, it, it was, it was crazy, like 50 million or something people used it in the first week or something, you know, it's, and, um, they attributed it to an increase in sales. I think, you know, Papa John's pizzas used it and they drove like very significant growth instantly, like with orders of Papa John's pizza. So you look at that and then people go like, well, that's how we're using the technology. I mean, it's one way, but entertainment people pay for entertainment. A lot of times people pay more for entertainment than they'll pay for their healthcare. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, <laughs> very true. Very you know, true. look at people spending on, uh, you know, their season tickets to a big sports team. Mm -hmm. so sometimes that's thousands and thousands of dollars, um, a year. And so, uh, but I, I think the other big one is education and it's training and it's across many different industries. Um, I think, you know, virtual reality has a, a way of making you feel like you've actually done on the job training, mm -hmm. takes you to a different world. And so when you can engage all your senses, like your movements, you feel like you've done something, you're naturally going to say like, Hey, I've done this already. I'm going to mm -hmm. be better at it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then there's, um, you know, kind of what, what I hear called frontline workforce, people who are in the field, maybe they're doing maintenance on equipment um, and they can have glasses that give them work instructions without having to do anything with their hands. They can use voice interaction. It, it verifies compliance. So work gets done better, faster. And, and, and there's also a, a much, and you know, this probably better than anybody with, with your line of work, but um, there's this huge skilled workforce gap that's happening and it's unprecedented. 
And the big, big corporations, even governments of the world are taking it very seriously um, with all the people retiring and the very sophisticated, skilled workers that are out there. Um, they're, they're leaving faster than you can hire. And typically these people have been doing the job 10, 20 years and they have so much expertise. Um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing it when I talk with like aerospace and defense companies, like they're dead serious that this is a massive problem. They're like, we have to train people better and faster so that they retain more. We have to give them augmented tools so that they don't have to know as much. It can be kind of automated. Otherwise, there's billions of dollars that are going to be left on the table that we can't even fulfill on demand because we don't have people that can do it. Mm -hmm. And so like training education has never been more important, I think, in my mind. Oh, it's yeah. massive. That potential industry, because employers for change, I'm just going to do my own shameless plug here. <laughs> it's, you know, it's an accelerated platform to recruit and to train, cross train, but it also have, I ha also have my own learning academy in there. So, and it's, is about Excel. It is so vital. I mean, the, the numbers are staggering when you look at how many people are being left behind because they don't know how to do something. And it's really, you can teach people tasks, but what you can't teach them, you know, is usually experience. And through, I did a skill study, you know, I got a grant for that. And it was really through this ability to accelerate cognitive skill development. It's through peer and reverse mentoring It's through servant leadership. It's about relationship going back to like what we were talking about earlier. And, you know, the more people remember that we're human and that we need each other, the better it's going to be. And the faster we can see actual experience, accelerating experience, knowledge, as well as those cognitive skills. Yeah. That's my thoughts. Anyway. Yeah, that's great. You mentioned something about Snapchat, but I've seen those filters on Instagram. I've seen them on TikTok and they're also being used by governments to profile people. There was something on Netflix called Coded Bias and I watched that one. It's a, you know, a documentary of how all of the facial recognition um platforms, the social side that are using them and they're actually using it to capture um you know, pictures of people to be able to see, you know, can we identify who the um, terrorists would be? And they're having problems because it's really good at picking up white people, but it's not so good at picking up people of color. And so that documentary, it's really eye opening. I would recommend it to anybody in the AR VR space. But Netflix also yeah. has um, the future of, and there's a lot of AR VR references in there. Um, it's it's a good. It's a good series. And um, yeah, I, I recommend it. And then there's Black Mirror, which is scary. <laughs> <laughs> it is. But I will say, like, there there's actually technology that I've seen just in the last couple of years that, that mimics some of this Black Mirror stuff. Um, um, I know this isn't the right word for it, but think of it as like, uh, it, it's like augmented rea reality removal. And it's using artificial intelligence and like computer vision to remove objects from your view, view that actually do that. exist. Yeah. That was a series. That was one of those shows. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, um, there's a, a company out of Germany that's actually working with this R and D lab. That's a, a division of Porsche, um, believe it or not, but and, and they were, they were showing some really cool features of it. Like for example, even on an iPad today, you can hold up an iPad and watch cars go down the street and the AI can remove the car from the scene looking through the iPad, but it can do cool things like replace it with like Harry Potter characters mm -hmm. that look like they're flying down the street. Yeah. And you're like, wow, that's actually really cool. But you think about the ethical implications of that. You can remove seeing someone in your life. Mm -hmm. if you don't like them. Right. I mean, <laughs> or if it's painful, right. Because you lost somebody, maybe yeah. you can, uh, kind of raise some of the things around about that person. How I yeah. saw it being used in a black mirror was to protect children from like, you know, aggressive dogs. The dog is barking and now the, the child doesn't see the dog. It's just a blurry image. And they weren't, I guess they weren't hearing the dog either, but they were able to walk safely to and from their home to school. So it, it's all yeah. about being used ethically and responsibly, right? And doing yeah. the right thing, not trying to. Right. Use it for evil. 
Yeah. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a big, big fan of those things. So I I'm really digging this whole conversation. Um, I'm really interested in some of the other things that wasn't one of the questions I asked, but because you mentioned some of this technology, what other things are out there that you think are going to be based on your VRAR association? What things have you seen that are going to be coming out to market? Maybe, maybe they're already there or maybe they're coming out soon. I don't know if that's an NDA thing. We can't talk about it, but if there is like, love to hear it. Yeah. Well, I think if if you look at like the big categories of of our life in general that get impacted, like communications, like one of them, transportations, another. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you look at communication, and you know how we've we kind of gradually like rolled into this whole Zoom uh, Teams kind of thing, yeah. virtual. But uh, I feel like in the next few years, you're going to see a, a very big shift into like. Uh, holograms yeah and like and it is vr and ar but it's like the technology is so profound it's going to get to where it's mainstream you know by 2030 i think where you know you'll you'll feel like you're in the same room with somebody and the whole you know volumetric capturing of them It'll just be a system that we have, uh, whether it's on our existing types of computers or it's new devices that we're adding to our life, um, because it helps us connect more. And and so, I think in general that's great for people. And and you look at like, um, I, I would say there, there's several companies doing this. There's some smaller startup companies. Uh, Google's even working on this this tool. And you know, you, it's kind of like you go in and sit in a little office area, but there's some cameras up. Um, it does facial tracking and then it mimics the, the image so that it, you think you're seeing 3d and you, you, you want to just reach out and touch the other person, but they don't exist there. <laughs> so it's, it's taking like zoom and teams and WebEx to, to a whole nother level. And there's a lot of people working on it. And so I think that's going to be really awesome in general. I and it's going to op open up a whole floodgate of like entertainment and, and, you know, how we, uh, connect with people on a, on a stronger basis. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that sounds really exciting. I've seen some, um, technology. This one, I think was like five years ago. I started seeing something where they could go and take your <clears throat> laptop. You were rolling out a, um, a keyboard. So you roll it out and then there was these three types of, I'll call them a pin, some type of device that when you put them together, it created a, like a little tent and then it was projecting up the, um, the, the screen that you would be able to see stuff on. So you could type with this little keyboard that just rolls up like a, a roll, if you will, or a, a towel. <clears throat> and then you also had this hologram kind of a screen and you know you're interacting with people that way and I went is this like what's coming is this what's out is it like I don't know is it just uh, yeah I, I don't know but that would be super cool instead of carrying around laptops and things of phone <laughs> whatever so yeah portable it is it, and you reminded me that I mean there's a company that I work with regularly um uh, I'm, I'm doing some consulting for this, this startup that has a, a wristband wearable. Think of it like a watch um, mm -hmm. without the watch on it, but it, it tracks really minute muscle movements in your arm and hand. And so they're, they're working on bringing a whole new like user interface to the, the AR VR industry so that instead of, um, you know, right now having to hold controllers in your hand or, you know, type on your phone, you just do like really tiny muscle movements with your fingers. And we already today have some of those things. Um, like, you know, you hear, you hear about it called hand tracking. Mm -hmm. and so even in like training experiences, right? Like in, in virtual reality, uh, it can track your hands and your fingers. And so you can kind of push buttons in space, but there's, there's one challenge with that is like your fingers have to be in the field of view of the cameras to be able to track them. And so like, uh, you start seeing people get fatigued. And so they're like, Oh, I've got to have my hands up here. That's a little unnatural to always have your hands up mm -hmm. touching and tapping. So 
if you can just have them to your side and move your fingers very subtly and get the same type of interaction. And, and so this team is um, working on that, but it's almost like a hybrid. So like you look at uh, like, what if you were wearing glasses and it tracks kind of where your eyes are a little bit. So it's, it's a hybrid of like what you're looking at, your eye movement, your head movement, and your finger movement all at the same time. And it becomes this whole new interface of how you interact with digital physical world. Hmm. So I think it's, it's pretty exciting to see like where that's going to evolve too. And you know, at, that could be like what breaks us free from having to carry around our phones all the time and getting muscle cramps in our neck by looking yeah. down at them all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so true. So true. <laughs> well, we're going to change some of the direction of uh, our conversation so we can go back to so we've been talking about a lot of the industry stuff and the future of so we've kind of crossed into two areas which is good um what are you most grateful for i'm going to guess that there's going to be mm, lots of stuff <laughs> um well i know like to me to me it's my my children i have four kids and it's just because i think you know i, I mean the next generation of 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 people and our kids are our future. And I'm just, I'm really proud of how they're developing, um, you know, and, and trying to inspire them and keep them motivated and all that. But I'm really proud of them. And I've had you know, really gratifying moments and you realize, you know, in all the things that we do in life, it comes kind of back down to those people you love and the people that trust you. So. Mm -hmm. So what are the ages of your children? Are you <laughs> open to sharing that? I mean, I'm sure they're little or something. Uh, they're, they're 18, 16, 14 and 12. Okay. So I was totally off because again, I was a middle and high school teacher and I would tell the kids, you know, God made you uh cute and little. So your parents would fall in love with you. They made you <laughs> teenagers. So they'd let you go. And so because you said that they, I was thinking of the way you were talking about them. Oh, they're little, they're still cute, but you've got grown up adults there in your house too. Yeah. 18 and 16, they're, they're pretty much halfway out the door. Yeah. Well, and I think, um, I've learned like you can apply this to business. I mean, it's, it's, it's their life lessons. Right. But, yeah. uh, there's this really cool story that taught me a lot about like it, if you give, you're going to get more. Yeah. And, um, you know, my, my daughter, I, so my 16 year old daughter, she, she wanted this really cool car and I'd been telling her this philosophy that, um, if you, if you really want something in life, you first have to think it, you have to be thinking manifest. I want that. Yeah. And not only just like, I want that. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to have that. And then, and then you have to start telling people about it because people are the ones that are going to help you get whatever you want. Like mm -hmm. there's very little you can just do on your own. And, and then once you start doing that, like you'll end up getting what you want. <laughs> <laughs> and so she comes to me and goes, dad, I want this, um, a certain type of car. It was like a baby blue Volkswagen Beetle convertible with mm -hmm. tan leather interior. She's like, dad, guess what? This is the car that I'm getting. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's a really cool idea. You know, and she kind of took me off guard. I've, I'm like, well, that's a great, uh, vision for you to have. And she's like, I don't think you understand dad. I am going to get it. And I would love it if you would help me get, the, get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow. Then she started, um, she started, uh, she, she cut out with her brother's help. Uh, she printed off 60 color images of the exact car that she wanted and put them everywhere around her house, taped them to everything you can imagine, including in my wallet. Including, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everywhere I went <laughs> like what? <laughs> um, but you know, I, I taught her about like, you got to tell people and you got to make them aware and she created awareness for sure. And so then I started, I started thinking about it and looking for ones and I, I ended up finding this gem of a car that had, they only made it two years and they haven't made the car for, I don't know, six or seven years. I found a car with only 300 miles on it, exactly like she wanted. I'm like, this has got to be a joke. So it turned out some dealership had gone bankrupt, put it in a warehouse. Um, and uh, while that all got sorted out over years and years, then it, it had been perfectly preserved. And so my daughter's like, dad, it was just total destiny. Like this is made for me. Yeah, so $2 million. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't quite that. Um, but 
the what we ended up doing is and um i we ended up getting the car for it. it was in los angeles um we ended up flying down to get it and i live in silicon valley but it was for her birthday and i said hey let's let's fly down there early get the car and then by noon we'll be at disneyland and we'll just spend the day like you and me at disneyland and um it was the most wonderful experience i've ever had with her mm -hmm. and i mean we just bonded for a lifetime um, yeah. and it's just <laughs> it's touching every time i talk about it because i you know you, you kind of look at it you're like oh it's this material thing that she wanted um but she kind of learned a life lesson about getting something and like how to approach it and then i learned like hey you know i i i get, I, I helped her get what she want but like i got the most wonderful memory of my life uh, with yeah. her because so, you know yeah. she listened to you and that just that doesn't happen very much <laughs> <for> teenagers <laughs> they don't normally you know like really they're listening they really are but they usually are dismissive is what i think and she obviously showed how much she respected you because she was listening and then she took that to heart and it is it's going to be something that has impacted her life forever so that's that is truly touching yeah. And I, and I hope in the end, she remembers that like magical day, you know, where we went to Disneyland and just had like this great friendship, you know, laughing, yeah. giggling, having the time of our life more than she remembers the car. Cause you know, material things can be, be replaced. They, they come and go. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. it's that, that memory that is the thing that's priceless. That's such a sweet story. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's oh, sure. Good. Yeah. <laughs> like, Thanks. Yeah. Definitely there. So, well, that probably, that was probably the person that has had the biggest impact on your life. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you top that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a lot, you know, a lot of people have had a lot of different types of impacts, but um, yeah, yeah family is definitely one. Yeah. So what do you want to be remembered for? You know, your life, you know, at this point in time or even later in life, what do you want people to know this is who he was and this is who he is? I mean, it ties back to those five words that you used to describe you, you know, essentially. Yeah. I mean, I kind of boil it down to like, uh, if, if people say, you know, Hey, he, he helped inspire me to do what I wanted to do in my life and, and, and do it better than I ever thought I could. That's what I'd want. Cause I, you know, I've, I've learned, you can't like, you can't force people or turn people into somebody they're not, mm -hmm. but you can give them the tools and give them the inspiration to be the best version of who they are. Yeah. And so that's what I aspire to be all the time and kind of the, the driver behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, something that would be kind of fun. Um, I did this for my parents, maybe your kids, maybe if they listen to this show, they'll, they'll hear it. One of the things that I gave that was the best present for my parents is I wrote them a letter and I told them everything that they did, you know, well, and everything that I was taking away from them, because many times kids don't tell their parents, Oh, you did this great, <laughs> you know? So, um, they found that very touching. And I still had that same conversation with them later as an adult, because I did that when I was younger, but even still as an adult, I said, so let me tell you, I, you know, this is what you did. Well, this is, I know I'm the best of you. And I am, I am also those things I don't like about you, but <laughs> I have learned to embrace both of those sides because I wouldn't be me without you guys. And so I just wanted them to know that it was like sobbing. My parents are oh, crying yeah. they're older. <laughs> going, no, no. You yeah. Know? That is, that's really powerful though. Yeah, it is. So it's important to tell people, you know, what we, what we think about them and, you know, all of that good stuff. Yeah. Well, well I appreciate you sharing that. You've inspired me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Maybe she'll listen to it and have her download. It. <laughs> so we're going to take a break for just a minute to acknowledge our sponsor, Transcend Network, and we'll be right back. Transcend Network helps early stage startup founders find product market fit through weekly experiments, receive fundraising support, and build a global founder investor network for ed tech and the future of work technologies. The Intern Whisperer is affiliated with Employers for Change, and we thank Transcend Network for being a sponsor of our show. 
And we're back to the second half of our show. What do you think 2030 looks like? I know you touched on on the previous side, but it could be like jobs or industries or just the world we're living in. I mean, do you think we're going to have flying cars like the Jetsons? (laughs) Well, (laughs) we were joking around about this earlier, right? Like, have you seen the movie (laughs) Wall-E? Yes. (laughs) But we're all just kind of going around in like little automated carts. I mean, you know, there's some truth to that, I think. Um, And, and yeah, actually I think there will be flying cars. Um, There's now, but yeah, like we're not driving all over the place in the skies. Yeah. It's not going to be quite like that, but um, I live in Silicon Valley, for example, and one of my neighbors works for this company called Archer and they're building like electric flying cars they're kind of propeller they're kind of like helicopters but it, they're electric a lot more lightweight um they're supposed to be much more nimble and kind of like the idea is hey if you need to go from san jose to san francisco uh, why would you take an uber take an archer and you know you'll be there in like seven or eight minutes um and so th- there's a lot that has to happen technology and policies and everything but I think it's it's coming. There's a lot yeah. of money being put into it, and and they could be flown automated too, right? So art of I think artificial intelligence has taken the world by storm here in 2023. People didn't see it coming Mm-mm. the way that it has, and I think uh, you know technology has been advancing, you know, since the beginning of time. But we've gotten to a point where it's 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 getting better faster. Yes. And the biggest impact though is it's becoming more humanistic and that's what blows people's minds is like wow i can type a question and it it generates a story that sounds like a human wrote it in 30 seconds yeah chat have you heard about the four industrial ages revolutions four industrial revolutions i have but enlighten me a little bit (laughs) yeah i'll save it for some other time when i when i get to chat with you but basically world economic forum has shared this and and i find it fascinating so there were these four times in our lifetime of where we've seen what is an industrial revolution and the first one was when we actually began to get the ability to create vehicles and then the second one is when we began um thinking of scalable ways that we can take products to market. I'm giving you a very short version of it. And the third industrial, so think manufacturing plants. And at the first industrial, it's like, you know, steam driven boats and, you know, things of using even horses to be able to get to someplace, but the invention of a car. And then in the third industrial revolution is when we created the internet and the fourth industrial revolution, which we're in, but we're moving into the fifth is really where everything is accelerating super fast. So the fifth industrial revolution is just right around the corner and it's it's going to be more of the AR VR experience that's out there. So I read a lot of these things and I find it's just so fascinating, anything that's about the future. And I talk a lot about these, uh, I speak at conferences that usually about what does the future look like for work and also just industries. And, you know, there's a lot of forecasts I have, but I'll save that for another time. Anyway. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I'm going to have to dive more into that. It's fascinating. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. World Economic Forum. They're pretty big. Um, So what do you think? I'm going to uh, one of our other questions here is robots, AI, augmented reality. I know you've already said that obviously it's going to be coming. And we were talking about how it's being used in transportation, um, but other ways that we would be able to see it, I think in, I don't know about there, I'm pretty sure you guys have it way more advanced than us, but here in Florida, um, I'm in Orlando also, um, we have some restaurants that are offering uh, robots that deliver food. And I've heard that there are those things in California also, like in the state parks where, you know, a little robot, here's your food that you ordered and it brings it to you (laughs) sitting at the park bench. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I've heard of a, just two, three weeks ago, a McDonald's that's 100% automated. There's no human in there at all. That's sad. 
because I sit here and I think, well, that's an ethical dilemma. And I'm putting two questions together because just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. What about the people that are, that don't have the ability, the mental capacity to be a programmer or, you know, that there's a, some type of a mental disability. There are jobs that they take that we need to be able to leave them to have because it seems a little bit scary that we could be making it so that we're eliminating some populations because what, they're not fast enough. They can't process. Yeah. A little bit like Hitler is what I'm thinking. Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You positioned it in a unique way that I, I don't know if I've ever heard. Um, because I, you know, you typically hear it's like, well, a lot of times it's replacing the jobs that people really would prefer not to do, mm -hmm. like very laborious, very tedious. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe there are parts of the job, you know, maybe the, the person dunking fries into the, the hot oil all day, maybe they, <laughs> they could think of better things to do. Yeah, <laughs> right? maybe, maybe, but I don't know. I just know that there's always going to be a place where we need to allow all people to be able to be employed and yeah. some of them won't be tech people necessarily. Yeah. Um, I will think, I do think though, there's a new type of technology worker. And so I have a friend um, here in Silicon Valley and he works at, at Apple and I can't be told all the things that he does, but he works in machine learning and does things in like their 3d mapping and stuff. And so um we were talking about this the other day and how um, over the next like seven or so years, he sees like the traditional software developer job um, is going to be completely transformed. You're going to see oh. far less. And um, we have no yeah. code now. We have no code and low code. You don't even yeah. need to have a full stack developer. I've always told people like five years ago, I said, dude, you need to be an AI. You should not be spending time on that you can build a wix website with like no code or you know yeah space. pick anything right right and 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 so like but but he's saying like there's a whole new wave of developers and they're like machine learning mm -hmm. right and um and artificial intelligence development and it's a whole different level and layer that has to be thought through Mm -hmm. And, and like even the process and the way thing projects are managed and things are very different. Um, and, and so you see that transition and that trend, you know, throughout time and through all these uh, revolutions like that you've talked about. And so the, the, I guess the hope is that there will always be something new needed that us humans can apply ourselves to. Yeah. We'll be um, more for um, people that can, you know, make things by hand instead of buying it through a 3D printer. We'll probably want to go and do business more with companies that um, keep human what should be human, you know, like remembering all people. Um, and I think that there's going to be more of that type of movement. I, I can absolutely tell you what I believe is going to happen is there's going to be more layoffs as people are continually laid off. We need to be gearing people up to be contractors and they're going to be hired for project work. And then they'll be let go because the only people that will have drop jobs would be uh, senior and mid-level people. And you'll be working with the project teams to decide who do you want to hire and bring into your company as a way to test talent out. And then the other side of it is that all those that don't make that grade, um, the the new currency to me would be cognitive skills. And, you know, you're measuring that um, to decide who has the ability to be in a production mindset and to turn things around quickly with the level of whatever, you know, your values are in your company. Um, but then there would be those that can't do it and they need to be trained and prepared to be contractors out there because there's not going to be tons of jobs in, in the way that we're expecting anymore. Yeah. It's cheaper yeah, that's... with less people, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's a good point that you make. It yeah. puts a lot of importance on how we continually train and evolve, right? Our education and mm -hmm. careers. Yeah. We really need to stay in this place of being continuous learners. For sure. And that's what you are. I can tell based on our whole conversation, you're, you're immersed in all of that for sure. Well, thanks. I try to be, 
Um, you've also made me realize I can do more. <laughs> so, so thanks. <laughs> can't we all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't we all? Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. So what do you, um, let me come over here. What is the best mentoring advice that you would want to share with our listeners? It can be anything in my listening audience, just so you know, it's, uh, employers and we have global reach. So we're most popular in the Ukraine. Don't know why, but, um, outside of the U S there's other countries that really listen to this show quite a bit. Um, we have uh, 21 to like mm, 65 is the age range and it's all industries. So you can pick, it's not like intern advice that you're sharing or entry level. It's, we have a pretty broad audience. Yeah, I would, I would say like, if I had to do it over again, I would, I would like make a commitment to invest in myself and like much more seriously from an earlier age. And, you know, it's that knowledge base that you learn that can't be taken away from you. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can lose money, um, but you can, and, and you can regain it, but you can lose it pretty quick. You can't, it's really hard to take away like what you've learned and that knowledge that you have. Um, and, you know, I, I like to say, um, you know, in, invest seriously in training programs like basics. Uh, and then, and then also try to try to try new things that you've never done before um, because it'll expand your creativity and open you up to new thought processes. And, and then, you know, from a mentor standpoint, like, I guess there's a lot of ways you could look at it, but if, if you're really trying to achieve high levels of success, it's usually, you know, find a, a mentor that's like magnitudes of order, more successful at something you want to be uh, than you are now. <clears throat> you know, not just one layer of management above you. So if, if you're a millionaire now, you know, go find somebody who's worth a hundred million dollars and try to get them as a mentor and say, how did you get there? Um, you know, if, if you're, if you're making under a hundred thousand, so like go, go find somebody who's making 10 million. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and try to get them to be a mentor and help guide you. So, and it, and it doesn't have to always just be financial, right? It could, no. it could be, some type of career path, but just go several layers above. Um, cause you'll think about achieving that a little differently than just getting to that one next ladder step. That's solid, solid advice, solid. And it's very true. And people think that that person may not be obtainable, but yet, you know, most humans are wanting to help, you know, and you say, so throw your resume out there and go, what feedback can you give me? You'll get probably a thousand people that will tell you what's wrong with it, <laughs> what's great with it. But that thousand people can also lead to a job. Yeah. And then a mentor, somebody that you could get as a mentor, maybe a couple of mentors, and then that leads to a job. So there's tons of opportunities out there. I love that advice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. How can our listeners find you? Um, website, you know, I have your LinkedIn profile. I have the, um, vrar.com website but how else can we find you and interact with you uh i the best is probably linkedin i'm probably most active on there and it, it's just the easiest way like you know to just go on linkedin and search my name nathan pettyjohn and uh you know send me an invite request and a, or message and i'm usually pretty responsive so i make people tell me how they met me <laughs> honestly so they should say that they listen to this show and then you'll know okay well they at least listen to you right yeah but, that would be great yeah now i always say if you want me to accept your connect you need to tell me how i met you right yeah yep <laughs> i agree yeah and so we had uh, the facebook page the twitter the youtube and then the company linkedin for vr ar association so just so our listeners know, look for him. He's out there and so is the organization. We're going to give you an immersegrowth.com immerse website too. So you should sure. probably tell them a little bit about what that company does. We told yeah. my best, that one. That's all right. No, Immerse Growth Network is um, essentially the company that I, I started to help you know achieve this mission of helping over 100 million people achieve greater success than they realized was possible. And so right now, what, what we do is um, consulting for companies in the immersive technology space to help them with game-changing partnership 
um, introductions and strategy and following that through with like full business development, um, even in kind of a sales capacity. And then we're also doing uh, training programs for um, sales and marketing to help everybody kind of get better at those skill sets. And I'm a, I'm a, a licensee of the Grant Cardone system, which is, um, you know, arguably one of the better sales and marketing programs out there. I think they do probably 200 million in training program sales a year. And that's, that's, that's a lot. And yeah. <laughs> people do it, use it because it works. Um, and I've seen it work. So we can take some of those programs and actually also like deliver those to our customers too. Oh, that was added bonus right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you again for being a guest. It's been delightful and uh, look for the show when it comes out and it's going to be May 16th. Awesome. Yeah. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So thank you to our sponsor, Cat5 Studios. Thank you to our production team and music by Sophie Lloyd. Visit Employers for Change at www.e4c.tech to learn how you can create real diversity and inclusion culture while skilling your people for the future of work. Thank you for supporting The Intern Whisper by subscribing to us on Podbean, our Employers for Change YouTube channel, or stream from your favorite podcast channel.